99.1 KFMG LP Des Moines, a listener-supported service of the Des Moines Community Radio Foundation, broadcasting from facilities generously provided by the spirited folks, the community-minded Hotel for Des Moines. They are open for business downtown at 10th and Walnut. We're up on the top floor streaming worldwide. Catch us at our website, kfmg991.org. A couple from local favorites, the Nadas, and uh, Nadas will be playing at uh, the State Fair starting this evening at uh, the AE stage, 7 to 9 p.m., and uh, we closed down that little twofer from the Nadas with <laughs> Templeton Rye. A nice, He's good, isn't nice he? little appropriate tune for this morning because joining me smooth. now, uh, well, it's it's all that radio training I took I when know. I was younger. Uh, it's Chris, when you get through the mail. I'm trying to introduce my <laughs> I'm trying to introduce my guest here now. My other guest, I'm John. I'm sorry, that's I'm a, not a that's, guest. That, I'm just this person <laughs> who pops in. You're my you're my co co host this morning. Hey, I'll shill for this guy anytime. He's one of the great creative spirits in the community. I will let you introduce him. He is Christian Day, and I would say probably one of a fine examples of uh, Renaissance man from Des Moines. I mean, the, the guy, you, you do everything. You're into music, you're, you're producing and directing films, you're filming films. I mean, uh, you've got short films, you've got uh, documentaries, uh, you're, you're working on commercials and, and public, uh, public service announcements, all kinds of things. Uh, what else are you doing? Have you got time to do anything well, else? Well, yeah, I, I find time. Um, I'm just like, I can be able to wait for at least a couple more minutes. So what can I do in those couple more minutes? Yeah, um, exactly. What I'm, my actual, I, this kind of, this deal kind of went down this last week. Um, I signed a licensing deal um, with this agency out in L.A. Mm. I had about 10 years worth of music. Before I got into film, I was making music. Not necessarily music music. I mean, I was taking apart children's toys and recording sounds and, you know, very avant-garde and, um, I finally was like, I have 10 years worth of music. I need to do something with this. <laughs> and because uh, I don't really have the time to really push it like I used to. And um, I thought, well, let's make use of what I have. And I contacted this agency, sent them a couple songs, and they were saying, oh, we love it. We love it. You know, what do you want to, what do you got? And I, I got about 70 recordings, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, and I said, 70? And I'm like, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> and like, when did you record 70? Most people have entire careers without recording that Yeah, much. yeah, exactly. And I said, well, you know, uh, when I was younger, instead of, uh, you know, really being in the bars, getting in trouble, I was in my basement taking apart <laughs> speaking spells. Instead and of my folks putting me on Ritalin, they let me Right, loose. exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, tape recorders, recording everything I could. And uh, made all these different avant-garde pieces, uh, soundscapes, um, you know, kind of like Brian Eno, and he defined uh, imaginary landscapes. Basically, each each piece kind of took you to another world. So, uh, and they loved it. So, this entire week, I've been uploading all this music to their catalog. It's been really time consuming. Now, you also uh, along the, these lines, you have a CD that's that's uh, released out online, correct? The uh, Dub and Deep Red. Yeah, Dub and Deep Red. I actually recorded it back in two thousand nine. It was during the winter, and um, I've always had this huge crush on Annette Funicello. And the old beach movies like Beach Blanket Bingo, Beach single Party, piece, single piece bathing suits, please. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I also was a big fan of exotic music from Martin Denny and Arthur Lyman. Oh, okay. And granted, I can't play like they like they can, but I wanted to create an album that was themed around this dark beach mm-hmm. and uh, record all these songs minus the drums, pretty much all in one night. I did the drums back in uh, Denver, which I was able to do both. Uh, a drum kit mixed with drum machine. I was able to kind of sync them all together, um, and then it, it was had a bit of a techno feel to it, except the dr- the the beat was more of a punk rock beat. So you'll have double bass going instead of a you know a, a thump 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 four four thing. Right, right. So, and uh, all the synthesizers were done with the VS uh, C- VS three. It's um, the old analog synthesizer that didn't have a keyboard, mm-hmm. had a joystick. Oh, and it was yeah. All patch cables. Wow, those. Yeah, that. Talking about our age now, <laughs> maybe that's, that's, maybe that's even funny. previous. He's, he's a retro guy, um, <laughs> uh, and I'm going to interject here because as you keep listening to what Christian is kind of into and uh, learn more about him, and I encourage you to visit his website, get connected with this artist to learn more. Uh, when he creates things, he creates things not just for self-indulgent, but he looks at these as creative products. And as you can hear from what he's talking about, he's looking for markets for these products. He recognizes that things he's created in the past may very well, in fact, that's what he's hoping for and what he's striving for, have a place where they can be sold in the future. He has commodities, creative commodities. And, you know, that sounds kind of callous and kind of, you know, you know stuffy suit type stuff. But it's something I encourage artists on a continual basis to look at what you're doing. If if you want to 
create art, don't. If you have to create art, do. And uh, make a way to make a living from it. Uh, and that's exactly what Christian is doing. Yeah. Christian, I was, I was listening to Dub and Deep Red, and, and in, you know, the way that I was listening to it, it sounds a lot like music that will fit onto a, a soundtrack or, or mm-hmm. as background music for commercial or something like that. Is, in your solo uh, music, is, is that what influences you the most, or is that what you're looking to do? Is that what you set out to do when you started doing this? Well, one of the big things I looked at is, can I export it? You okay. know, and, you know, where, where, how, many, how many different markets can it go to? Mm-hmm. I mean, the average listener, you know, can listen to it and say, well, that's kind of repetitive. Oh, that, then there's like this, you know, you listen to the first two tracks that are kind of repetitive, but it's also hypnotic. Mm-hmm. And then you go into this whole, the, you know, the track uh, three, the uh, too much wind removed my face. It had that kind of like water drop sound. Almost had this surreal spooky feel to it. Right. And I said, you know, these tracks can, I can see them in a commercial. I can see them, you know, even like a high tech car commercial. Yeah. You know, yeah. And I can see it in film. Um, to make a product, I mean, if, if it can't entertain an audience, then you, as, as John was saying, it is self-indulgence and it's an, everything's an ego piece. If you can market it and you entertain people with it, you know, now you got a business. Right, right. And there's, I think there's a, always people forget to think about the business of art. Right, okay. And, and, and why don't you explain that further as to your philosophy <laughs> behind the business of art then? Well, let's, let's look into, not to jump ahead, but look at the, the main Iowa documentary series that okay. I started. Okay. They're, 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 the subjects are Iowa-based, but it has to be able to market outside the state. Right. I, I, you know, I want Iowans to love it, but we're, we are not evolving as a, a, you know entertainment industry if we are just making things for ourselves. Kind of like we've made an amazing art scene here, um, but we've made like this bubble that we all live in, and right. we all like it here. But we need to bring people from out of town in to want to see what we're doing, come to our art shows, you know, come to our concerts, you know, and, you know, say that Des Moines is now a destination. Iowa is now a destination. I see Des Moines as like the next Vancouver, uh, the next Chicago. It's at a point right now where things that, stuff that I'm doing, some of these others are doing, people are taking to it and saying, oh, this is great. This is exactly what we need. This is building this community. And it's all really happened in the last three years. And that's fantastic. But we got to keep growing. Well, I know as universal as as music is, and, and even maybe even a little more so than than film. I, I think the documentary series you you, you touched on this Made in Iowa series uh, that you're working on the second one now. The second one, and I just uh, kind of, I don't want to say too much, but the the third one is is about in, ready to in, the ground. In the works. Well, it, it's, <laughs> it, things are pretty much a done deal, but oh. I've had to because Templeton's taken so long. We're, oh. You know, we're on month four for shooting. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I I had to push it back about a month and a half. To, I was hoping to take you know one month off just to work on some other things, but unfortunately, um, it, like most of my projects, it's like one's done. All right, next day I'm starting another. Right, right, so. right. Well, well, let me ask a pop in here with a quick question, Gary. Uh, there are a lot of folks out there, and they have examples up the wazoo where people say, "Well, man, what are you doing here in Des Moines, or what are you doing in <laughs> Iowa, or why are you staying here?" Uh, I. I and don't get me wrong, because I do encourage talent to see what else the world has to offer, but also think in terms of your primary hunting ground, so to speak, and Iowa can be that for the creative mind. Uh, think about how you can then come back and create stuff that can be exported. So how do you answer these people who say, well, what are you doing here in Iowa still? Well, you know, you can go to L.A., you can go to New York, Um but you're you're kind of, there's a lot of experience there. But you're kind of just like everybody else who's there. Every person who's working in every diner <laughs> is trying to do what you're doing. You come to a community uh, like Des Moines, where there's only maybe a handful, or, you know, less than you know five fingers worth of people right. doing what you're doing. You have a chance to get things going a lot faster, and also you're you're able to kind of. Uh, You've got first pick of the talent pool and, and the resources pool, at you least, do. that and way. And you also can build, rather than being a hired hand, I, you can also grow a business. You, can you do like to control things, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> well, no, it's important. There's, and there's nothing yes, wrong with that. It was a softball I tossed, and you, sno- you just knocked it out of the park there. But um, uh, I, it's something that I encourage a lot of people is uh, – 
think about you know what kind of creative roots you can sink here in the community because as you said you can control your destiny much better here than when you're uh, in this flotsam and jetsam of creative talent in the New Yorks and the Los Angeleses of the world because I remember my wife telling me when she uh, cast a stage play in Los Angeles several years ago she had, as they called it down, she had 900 people from which to choose from and she was looking at the film and television series credits and commercial credits and stage credits of these people including Broadway and touring national tours yeah. Uh, and that's exactly what you're fighting with out there. It's not to say that we have lesser talent here. It's just that we have talent that can manifest itself in much neater ways. And you can realize your dreams. That sounds hokey, but, you know, here I am at my age still believing that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the eternal optimist way to go. Silver around that cloud. <laughs> yeah. Now, besides beside your solo uh, activities music-wise, uh, you also are in a duo with uh, a guy named Mike Fraser, the, the curly-haired jokers. The curly-haired jokers. Okay. Um, one night, uh, I was in his basement. We used to record some Almost drums. reached for the temple and then reached for my coffee there. Um, Oops. Oops. We... Uh, you know, we're, we're both big fans of uh, Melvin's and this. Uh, there's this Japanese band called Acid Mother's Temple. Oh, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah the very actually, I do. Stuff. For <laughs> some odd reason. Um, and, and we wanted, you know, here's the thing. We, we, n neither of us have time to ever perform live. He does do some street performance, but mm -hmm. really no one knows about this guy. He's kind of outside of any creative art scene. Right. But he's a fantastic guitar player and a fantastic drummer. And uh, we, would, we would get together and we record, we write and record, you know, usually two or three songs in one night. And then that's usually the end of it. And we, we the last one we recorded, which I, I know I sent to you that the the house that Jack built. Yeah. You know, we were like, we're on to something with this. We loved what we were doing. I mean, that was recorded maybe in forty five minutes. Wow. You know, that's that's pretty good for forty five minute yeah. recording. Yeah. And you know, and we were both able to use our own talents. He played drums and guitar, and I think he actually did the bass track on that one. And then I was able to go in with uh, my homemade electronics and do all these different sounds. I did some additional percussion in there and you know, and it definitely had a nice psychedelic feel. We were looking at it and it's like, yeah, this is a good groove. We actually recorded two more and um, one with like Rain with him playing guitar with a, are you familiar with a Buddha machine? It's a little drone box. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah, yeah. Recorded with that. I mean, it was just, it was a blast and we were both able to do everything that we're able to do together and it was fantastic see and you're you're working with so many different people uh you know not not only musically but i mean in the in the film community you've mm -hmm. gotten involved with all kinds of people uh and and let let's turn towards the film because okay. you you're involved in a, in a pretty important thing for like you said the business of art uh which is the the documentary series the made in iowa mm -hmm. documentary series which I, I agree with you. I think is going to probably wind up pulling several people into the area, at least in their mind, if nothing else, uh, just by getting it out there. And and I'm very appreciative that you're doing something like this. Now, your first uh, project for the uh, the Made in Iowa series was the uh, Hybrid Pioneer, uh, Brent Housing Housing Gay. Yeah, Housing Gay. Yeah, Housing we. Gay. Uh, that was made as a work and trade. I was working on a feature film um, starring uh, Frank Mink uh, called Vessel. And at the last minute, you know, we're doing this whole Andy Warhol drug art scene. I'm like, I could, I would love to do some body painting. And this is before I had met many people, so I didn't know, you know, Emily Savak or any of them. Mm -hmm. um, and Brent had posted a photo of basically his stencil art on a person. And I was like, I want that. That's perfect. It's very pop art, you know. And But we didn't have the budget for that. You know, most of our budgets, you know, we're throwing around nickels and dimes like they're manhole covers and, you know, making it work. And I said, listen, man, let's do this. Let's do a work and trade. We'll do like an art film or something together. Well, that art film turned into this whole documentary because we're both from the Quad City area. We're both born along the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, River rats. We are. We are. <laughs> rough <laughs> rough yep. river town. Hey, we you can know. say it that when we are. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But, you know, we, we, uh, we had similar backgrounds, and we both had the punk rock background. And when I started making this, we had no outline. We had no money. And we just went for it. And it was just a lot of running around with the camera, getting this stuff. You know, sometimes we would come up with a concept and we would go shoot it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that I spent maybe $200 to make it. And that $200 turned into the best foreign documentary at this, uh, at this film festival in Poland, the DIY Film Fest. And someone asked me, you know, how many, how many uh, films were in there? Well, it was a, it was a, it's an international documentary film festival yeah. about the, DI, the, the DIY culture, and we won Best Foreign Film. You know, that was, I thought that's, that's amazing. Big. You that's know? big. That's and it huge. also shows that it was not that we were noticed 
not only outside the state, but in another country. Outside, yeah, outside That's where the, the nation. subject matter becomes something more than like a, a community film offers. Because usually, the, you know, there's no appeal outside of the community. Here's something that does translate much further. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's not necessarily all about Brent in this film. It's about the kind of underground art community that we have here. You know, we it's, it's not the Mulbergs, it's not anything like that. It's about the people who do doing these art shows in warehouses and uh, using found objects and scraps and, you know, kind of like the, uh, you know, when you think about the uh, the uh, the punk rock era in New York back when CBGBs was still open. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah. We, we have, uh, like, uh, uh, Lisa Gertis and uh, Samantha Lee and, yeah. and, and every once in a while talking about the underground yep. scene here, too, so, and, yeah. And it's, it's, it's like that's what our, that's what this, the scene that we have here, it's, it's fantastic. You know, we had a lot of great interviews. John was, we got interviewed, and, you know, I showed up here for, you know, maybe 15 minutes, shot his interview, and... You know, I remember he was like, I have no yeah, idea fun. what you did with uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it. It, it. was fun to end up being part of this project just because uh, it's easy for me to to brag on people who, uh, who I believe in. And that's exactly what he presents is this potential. This is one of the reasons why Des Moines is getting recognition. People don't even really can't put their finger on. They can't put into words. But we have this uh, kind of counterculture thing going, burbling beneath the surface. And... Brent has reached outside of the state of Iowa, as has Christian and people like that. They're going to places across the country uh, to foreign lands just to present their work, and it's being seen and accepted and recognized, and that is really kind of neat. Now, uh, your next uh, project, which got pushed back, the, the, the post-production got pushed back a little bit, the Templeton Rye, which which is going to be an interesting story. I mean, there, there's there's already... Uh, you know the groundswell of word of mouth on Facebook. Templeton Rye. There's there's been trouble again, bootlegging trouble for Templeton Rye again uh, in this this modern world. And uh, you're doing a documentary, the, uh, the the Templeton Rye, which is the second in your uh, Made in Iowa series. Is it going to be just titled Templeton Rye, or no? The uh, well, right now we're working with the title Capone's Whiskey, the story of Templeton okay, Rye. Okay, that's what that's what I thought. Um, um, you know, we've we've uh, we really were able to touch on the whole Capone connection with Iowa because it was a long Highway 20. Capone used to travel from Chicago to Sioux City because he had a brother, uh, Two Gun Hart, who was a sheriff. And he actually, he was, uh, during Prohibition, he was uh, a speakeasy guy that used to go in and, and bust out uh, speakeasies, mm. which was really kind of funny. Yeah. Um, but he would travel <laughs> along, and he had buildings in you know Dubuque. You, know, you have the Julian, you have Fort Dodge, and then Sioux City. And it was along that that trail that he had Templeton Rye. And it wasn't, you know, people say, well, he didn't, that wasn't his big product. It was uh, Canadian gin, which is, I, that's true. Templeton Rye is what he served him, himself and his friends. That was, that that was, was his, his private stock. Yeah, that was That was the dream. good stuff. Yeah. yeah. It, it, and it still is. And, you know, the funny thing about Templeton Rye, it was so hard to get then when you had to know someone who knew someone. And even nowadays, even it's in the still legal, like the that, legal product <laughs> is you have to know someone. You have to know the the store and say, "Hey, man, I'll slip you another twenty if you can just hold that a bottle for me." I yeah, I've already I've heard stories already. It's 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 very cool. And the mystique has transferred over. It's fantastic. Well, if people are interested in in seeing uh, your films and or your music, do they go to the same place? Or are there separate places they they can go to? Is it all online in one one? Uh, quick stop shop. Do you have a website? Oh, uh, <laughs> Christianday.com, spelled with a K, K R I S. Um, you know, we show all over the place. Um, there's a couple deals that I can't necessarily talk about publicly yet. <laughs> you know? The guy builds intrigue into a I, simple little I interview. Know, oh, right, I know, right, right, right. Like but that. my, you know, you know, we've done, we've done. Some but if you contact me by email through my website, that's Christianday.com. Yeah. I'll slip you a little more information. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know about here's, it. An, here's an extra twenty hold back that film. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. But you know, we everything has a you know we want to market everywhere. We want we would like to see independent film, especially in Iowa, be back in the theaters and you know not necessarily renting a theater to show a movie. We want to get in circulation. Right. Right. You know, and that and, you know not only does that build the film industry and shows that you know we are marketable, but it also you know. There's so much culture here, especially in the state that's kind of hidden, just like the story of Templeton Rye that's out, you know, in parts of Iowa. You know, we always think about Des Moines or Cedar Rapids or Davenport, Iowa City, Ames. But, we, you know, we think about Manning, Templeton, um, you know, West Central, you know, or uh, Aspinwall, which is a town of 50. You know, there's a lot of history in those areas. And, uh, you know, my, my goal is to get all these stories out.
Well, we, we really appreciate you coming by and, and uh, letting us in on uh, this corner of the, the extra two minutes that you had today. Appreciate it. I, you're such a busy man, He's going to lose two minutes of sleep now because of you, man. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Man, I shouldn't have done yeah. that interview. i, I got to stay up till three now. Uh, again, uh, Hybrid Pioneer already out, uh, part of the Made in Iowa documentary series. The next one to come out, Templeton Rye, released in the next uh, couple months or so, I believe. Mm-hmm. And Holmes Whiskey. Dub in Deep Red, Christian's uh, solo CD, and uh, look for Curly Haired Jokers, his duo with Mike Frazier, uh, Renaissance guy. You, you seriously, you do it all. Thank you. And, uh, and thanks for uh, doing some of it here with us today at 99.1 KFMG. This is Elvis.